Hey everybody, my name is Adam. I am a top MCAT scorer and MCAT tutor here at Shamasian Academic Consulting. And today I'm going to be walking you guys through a biochemistry passage related to the MCAT. So yeah, let's get right into it. So to start out, let's just talk about the MCAT in general. Um, the MCAT is called the Medical Admissions Test, MCAT for short. It's an exam that uh, many students take to gain admission to different professional schools like medical schools like MD programs or DO programs and there's other professional schools as well that would accept MCAT scores for admission. Um, so yeah, you want to take this before you apply to become either an MD or a DO or another similar profession that accepts this, um, this exam. So it's about a seven hour test and it's divided into four sections. The first section is called chemistry and physics section. Then you get a short break. Second section is cars, critical analysis and reasoning section where you just do reading and answering of questions. Then you have a short lunch break. Third section is the biology and biochemistry section which is the section we're gonna be working on today. And then another short break and then you finish out with the psychology and sociology section. Okay, so yeah, within this third section of the exam, the biology and biochemistry section, um, a good portion of those questions are going to be biochemistry based. Um, and so to kind of talk about strategy of the overall section, there's um, 95 minutes for the whole section in which you have 10 passages with questions related to the passages and 15 questions that are not based on any passage. So a good starting strategy to kind of get going with um, the biology and biochemistry section and kind of just get practicing is to do the first 15 discrete or the questions that are not based on passages questions first in 15 minutes right so you skip through the passages get to that first discrete question answer it in about a minute and then you give yourself down to 80 minutes remaining um, with all of the discrete questions finished with just the 10 passages remaining then with those last 10 passages in 80 minutes. It's pretty easy to divide up that time. You want to do about eight minutes per passage. And a nice way to kind of keep the pressure off a little bit so you're not micromanaging your time is to divide it up into three passages each. And there's a last section which is passages of four. So you'll have eight minutes left for the last one. But yeah, you want to be able to be like, okay, eight times three, eight, 16, 24. So you want to work in 24 minute chunks, right? 24 minutes to do three passages instead of micromanaging eight minutes for one. So we're going to be walking through one five question passage today, um, which is about normal, like five or six questions is a, is a normal passage. Um, we're going to do it in a little longer than eight minutes today because we're going to be really breaking down how you want to read a passage and how you want to try to answer these questions. Um, we're also going to do a, a short break in the middle to talk about related content from our um, Shamasian content guides. Um, but if you're doing this on your own, or if you wanna do this passage before we start with it, and you wanna pause at the beginning here, give yourself a timer for eight minutes and see if you can read the passage and answer the questions in less than eight minutes, because that's kind of the goal that you wanna get to on test day. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump into this. We're gonna be kind of be doing the basic um, strategy for a passage, which is reading the passage, highlighting it, looking for important information, and then going over to the questions and answering it based off of what we understood. Okay, so let's start here in the first paragraph. So we got nuclear estrogen receptor 2, ERB2. Okay, so I'm going to highlight this because they gave us an acronym. So I want to be able to find that and be able to know what it's called in case we see it later on, either in the questions or in the passage itself. So this receptor suppresses tumor growth and modulates cancer cell proliferation in breast cancer. Okay, so it's a good thing. It's, a, it's like an anti-breast cancer receptor. Okay, Loss of ERB2 is shown to correlate with early stages of ductal and breast tumors. That, that makes sense. I'm going to highlight that. Loss equals tumors, right? So that, again, evidencing that ERB2 is a good thing though the specific mechanism is largely unknown. Okay, that's probably what we're gonna study. When we typically see um, a, a normal biology or biochemistry or even chemistry or physics passages, they set it up, and they tell you that something is unknown about it, and then they do some studies on it, and you learn a little bit about 
what's going on, um, and then you can use that information to answer questions. So that mechanism of how ERB suppresses tumor growth in breast cancer, we're going to study today. So let's see what they think. Researchers hypothesize that identifying and characterizing multiprotein complexes involved in ERB2 function might identify the molecular basis for the role of protein in breast cancer, in BC. Right, we highlighted it up there. Okay, so it's something about complexes. Right? We don't really know what they're going to look at about these complexes, but something about um, these complexes, identifying and characterizing these complexes might help. So there's something about complexes. So we'll go on to paragraph two here. Using interaction proteomics, which combines native protein complex purification and mass spectroscopy, it was determined that ERB2 interacts with other proteins in BC breast cancer cells, and this interaction is mediated by one or more RNAs. Okay, so we're going to be looking at RNAs that mediate this interaction, and then these complexes that we were looking at in paragraph one are, um, they're, they're just other proteins, right? We don't really know much about it. So we're just going to say other proteins mediated by RNAs. Um, we should also know what native protein means, right? Native means like in the original folded um, conformation that we have, right? We have primary structure, secondary, tertiary, and then quaternary structure, right? Native is going to be that quaternary structure, right? However, those subunits are combined. Is there multiple subunits, one subunit? Just native, right? So it's um, they we're not breaking it down in any way. So that's good to know. And we're just kind of looking at it. So let's see what they're going to do with this. Okay, so to probe the effect of RNA on this ERB2 complex formation, researchers treated a nuclear extract containing ERB2 and its putative binding partners with RNA ACE. So I guess they just put ERB2 and its binding partners and then RNA ACE, right? The, um, enzyme for RNA. The results from the experiment are shown in figure one. Okay, cool. So here's figure one. Um, we got y-axis. Oh, this looks like, so this isn't a graph, right? This is a Western blot, right? And we should use our mnemonic for that, right? What is a Western blot, right? So we know our mnemonic of snowdrop, S-N-O-W on top, and then drop on the bottom. D R O P, right? Notice that I kept the O's um, lowercase because we don't need those. Those are not related to anything, but this helps us remember what each of our blots are, right? So our southern blot, or S, is looking at DNA. Our northern blot, our N, is looking at RNA. And then our western blot is looking at protein. Okay, so this is a western blot. So we're looking at proteins, which makes sense because. We said earlier that these were protein complexes. Okay, so cool. So this Western blot analysis without, without or without, I think that's a typo. I think that means with or without RNAase, right? So we have without at first, right? That's what this negative sign would mean. So we have three bays with negative, right? And this is Western blot, right? Which means that we're traveling in this direction. Um, so when we don't have RNAase, we're traveling pretty far, um, which remember on Western blot, that means that we're pretty small, which means that we're probably not bound together, right? Because when things bind together, right, to ERB2 is a receptor. Receptors are very often, if not always, proteins. Um, so that protein, ERB2, combining with other proteins, right, to make a protein complex, um, would not travel very far down a Western blot. So when we don't have RNAase in all three of these, one, two, three, um, we're traveling and we're making these lines. They're not all identical, but they're traveling down and they're making nearly identical lines. And they're going pretty far. So that means that we probably need it. That's kind of what we thought. The mediation is important. And then we look over here. When we add the RNAase, right, these three, we have kind of general lines kind of here-ish, here-ish. Here, it's just kind of smudgy, but they look very different from each other, right? If I erase my markers, um, they're they're kind of generally the same, but you know that's kind of important to note that they don't look exactly the same, which is kind of what you would expect. They wouldn't all combine 
perfectly in the same way, right? Because if they're putting all of the binding partners in at once, some of them may bind in one bay and others may bind in another. So anyways, interesting to look at. We're just, big thing to note here, it's a Western blot, which means we're looking at protein. And then this kind of RNA ACE thing at the top here when we don't have it and then we have it and we see that difference. So it is kind of proving that RNAs really do mediate this because they have a pretty significant effect on our ERB binding to other things. We don't know what those other things are yet, but they do. Okay, cool. So let's go on then and let's look at this next paragraph. Let me grab my highlighter. All right. So yeah, this next paragraph here. Next, the researchers analyzed the complex formation with the putative binding partner AGO2. Okay, so now we got a name. So we're gonna have a complex with this, this guy, our one specific binding partner in the absence and presence of RNAase. Okay, so we're doing binding with this thing and then RNAase and seeing what happens. The results are shown in figure two. Okay, so that's what we're gonna look at. The researchers analyze the nuclear extract, right? So that would be input, that would be just the AgO2. The amount of bound AgO2, right? So that would be we added in ERB2. And two TeV, IgG, Sephiroos, column elutes using a Western blot for AgO2. Okay, that's a lot. I'm just gonna highlight this just in case we need to look at it, but we don't really need to know a lot about this, right? We should recognize IgG, right? That's a one of our immunoglobulins, right? That's gonna be one that's gonna be a little bit more specific, probably suggesting adaptive immunity, right? If you think back to our um, immunology or like our, our immune system, right? So we can recognize that, but not sure exactly what that's gonna mean without a little bit more context. So, and this is the end of the passage. So I guess we can just look at if there is any trends. If we get a question, we know it's here, but might not mean a lot. And that's something we have to do a lot with the biology and biochemistry section is they're gonna give you a lot of information, some of it highly complex like this, and not all of it is useful. So sometimes you read it and you're like, I don't really know that much about this. It kind of seems outside of the scope for the MCAT and you just kind of move on. If you have to use the information, you get a question that's specific about it, you come back because you highlighted it and you read more carefully for what can we pick up here. But this might be beyond the scope here. So yeah, let's look down here. So again, we got a Western blot. This time we got labels for 100 kilodaltons, 130 kilodaltons, and then we have the ones without RNAase and then with RNAase, right? Okay, and as we noted, right, we got input, bound, and then we have these two immunoglobulins um, for some kind of adaptive immunity thing. Um, so interesting to note, without RNAase, you know, right, again, same input, doesn't really matter. The inputs look the same, which as they should. Um, and then we have a little bit of a line here with in the bound portion, right? So it seems like AgO2 binds without RNAase, but then when we add RNAase, it doesn't bind as much, right? If you kind of look at the difference, let me erase my highlight here so I can make that a little bit more clear. But right, if we're looking at this bound line, yeah, there we go. Looking at this bound line, it's um, present there, but it is not very present there. Like same thing with the TEVEL1, we see a presence line there, but then TEVEL1 here is pretty absent and it's absent on two for both of them. Okay, so kind of just interesting to note. We don't need to spend too much time on this because I'm not sure what they're gonna ask us, but um, it seems like it could be relevant. And if you have any questions on figure two, we can go and address it. Okay, so before we dive into these questions, let's take a quick break to talk about content, right? So this, this uh, passage talked about purification and mass spec. So we're gonna talk about one kind of biochemistry lab technique. Uh, there's a, a few that we need to know for the MCAT, but this is one of the more higher yield ones, and that's chromatography. Right, so we have a bunch of different types that we should be familiar with. Right, we got anion exchange columns, cation exchange columns, gel filtration, size exclusion chromatography, and affinity chromatography. These are all different versions. So before we kind of dive into all of these versions, we always have over here, or this is a, a like kind of a little diagram from the content guides on shamassianconsulting.com. Um, and you can kind of see what we're doing here. We're taking our substance that we want purified, or 
separated or something and we're putting it into our column, right, our chromatography, and we're gonna be eluding out these different fractions, right, one, two, three, and four. And our mobile phase is gonna be kind of like everything. Our stationary phase is like what we're choosing on purpose to catch certain things. And then some will pass through and pass out and some will get stuck. And then we might elute the rest of the stuff that got stuck out later with like a wash. Like a, a lot of times there's a second step called a wash. So let's talk about, now that that's the basics of what's happening, let's talk about the chromatography itself, right? So anion exchange columns, right? And cation exchange columns, they're named this because that's what we're aiming to catch, right? So an anion exchange column is trying to catch anions. And remember, like anions are negatively charged. So we're trying to catch the negatively charged um, things in our mobile phase, right? So that means our actual column itself is gonna be positively charged, right? So we're catching those anions, which means that our positively charged things are actually gonna pass through first, and then our negative ones are gonna be caught, a little bit more purified, and then we can elute that out with some type of wash, and then we're good to go. Cation exchange is just the exact opposite, right? Cation is what we're aiming to catch, so we're gonna use our negative, um, stationary phase in order to catch all of our anions right because or all of our cations because right those are positively charged they're going to get caught and then we'll wash them out then we have gel filtration and size exclusion right that's where we're just trying to look at our native conformation of our proteins or just like our whatever we're looking at in general a certain compound and it's going to be um, filtering based off of size exclusion right there's just going to be certain holes you can kind of see if i zoom in on this um, this part of the diagram here, how there's kind of like jagged holes in here, right? So that's like a certain things can pass through here that are like of a certain size, right? They might fit through, but then if we have a slightly bigger compound like this, right, it's going to get stuck and it's not going to be able to pass through, right? We're going to do that so we can separate our smaller things from our larger things and we can figure out kind of generally how big something is, like either in kilodaltons or something similar. Um, so yeah, size exclusion is just going to be, right, just based off of size. We're going to divide, take the smaller things are going to pass through and the large things are going to stop. And then finally, our affinity chromatography, right, that's going to be like a really largely specific form of chromatography. We're going to take a specific interaction with something. Right here, we have a whole bunch of sulfurs around a negatively charged things, right? Why would we do this? We're probably looking for some kind of compound that would also have a sulfur so that we can form disulfide linkages, right? So that's gonna be a very specific type of interaction. Um, another like really commonly asked about form of affinity chromatography, chromatography is this thing called nickel chromatography, right? So nickel is basically, we just have a stationary phase of nickel. Um, and what we need to do then is we need to catch something with that nickel. So what we do is we do something called histidine tagging. Right? We know what histidine is, right? Histidine is one of our amino acids, but we're gonna actually histidine tag one of our um, proteins that we want to get caught. It might be stuck in something and we don't actually know how much of it is in that. So if we histidine tag it and then we put it into a nickel column, it's gonna, it's gonna go through affinity chromatography because they have an affinity for one another and it's gonna bind to it and then we can wash it out and then we can see that it's been separated and purified. So yeah, that's kind of the basics of some of our types of chromatography. Um, this is part of our content guides that talks through all of the different biochemistry lab techniques. I can't talk about them all today because I don't have enough time, but this is one of them and one of the higher yields ones. There's a lot of other high, high yield ones there as well. Um, so go ahead and go check that out. Um, the link should be in the in the description. So yeah, now with that in mind, let's get into these questions here and let's see how well we can do here. All right, so I'll start with number one here. Which of the following most likely contributes the greatest amount of stability to the ERB2-AGO2 interaction? Okay, so the ERB2-AGO2 interaction, right, that was at the end of our passage there, right, that's protein to protein. Right, so that's pretty important to note, right? This is a one entire protein bonding to a whole nother protein. So we're definitely looking for something called intermolecular interactions, right? We're not gonna look for intra, right? Because these proteins are already formed, right? So this is gonna be some form of intermolecular interaction. So let's walk through these here. So we got disulfide bridges, right? That is a very strong intramolecular or intraprotein interaction, right? That's 
often use like um, when we're getting into that tertiary binding, right, those side chains, or even quaternary structure, but that's all within one protein. So that's not a great answer there. Hydrogen bonding, that is a pretty common one. So this would be common type of interaction for inter proteins, right, in, in between two different proteins. So this is pretty good for now. Let's see if we find something better. Hydrophobic effect, um, that's, that's really good, right? So remember when we're thinking about proteins interacting with each other, we're gonna have certain sides that are gonna be hydrophilic, hydrophobic, right, depending upon the amino acids. This is really, really good, right? So we can definitely have the hydrophobic effect impacting how stable this is and how, like, how much room it has to move around, right? We're gonna be more stable with the hydrophobic effect for sure. And then salt bridges, right? No, that's gonna be similar to disulfide linkages, right? That's gonna be within one protein. So we're deciding between B and C. Hydrogen bonding um, is probably not going to contribute that much. It could happen a little bit, but since we got hydrophobic effect, right? That's, that's kind of like a buzzword for intermolecular or interprotein bonding. So we're, we're gonna go with hydrophobic effect here. Um, so yeah, good, I hope that that one made sense there. Let's move on to number two here. Researchers decide to purify ERV2 using a nickel column. Okay, so we talked about this. This is a high yield type of column. You might see this again during your practice. They most likely prepare ERV2 with, right, so this is one of those questions, and when it comes to MCAT biology questions, when you see a buzzword in the question stem, or when you like recognize something from your outside content knowledge, you often want to try to answer the question before looking at the answer choices. So like even like put your hand up and like block it and be like, I am going to try to answer this just based off of my memory, like either from an Anki card that you remember or a flashcard or just from the con reading the content guides. So a nickel column is gonna be tagged, right? ERB, we're gonna tag it with histidine. So we need to look for a histidine tag. Um, so now let's look at these answers, right? A, C terminal, histidine tag, right? That's histidine six. So that looks pretty good, we like that. Alanine, that's not even charged, so I'm not sure I would tag anything with alanine. So that's a pretty bad choice. Um, and then uh, glutamate, right? That's going to be okay, right? Glutamic acid or glutamate. That could work. Um, it's not going to be specific to nickel, but hey, that's that's that could be maybe with a different type of affinity chromatography that could work out. And then veiling, right? That's uncharged, nonpolar probably a pretty bad answer for all forms of tagging. So we're definitely between histidine and glutamate. Um, but histidine, right, we talked about this earlier, that's gonna be specific affinity chromatography for nickel. All right, great. Number three here, to interpret the results of figure one, the researchers must assume all of the following except, right, so we've done questions like these before, but right, when we're looking at a question and it mentions specifically just one of the figures, we need to make sure that we choose an answer that's only true and comes from that figure. Because a lot of times they'll give us an answer choice that might be true from like, you know, in this case we have figure one and figure two. They might be giving us an answer choice that's true for figure two, but it has nothing to do with figure one. So we need to be careful that we're being specific to figure one. Um, so let's go over and just really quick glance at it, just in case we forgot. Um, on test day, it's just gonna be sitting there over the sides. So it'll be pretty easy to glance at. But right, we're looking at a Western blot that's looking at just ERB2 with or without RNA ACE, right? And there it is, and we can see these two lines. It did make a difference, right? That's, that's it. So if they're saying they must assume, that means they're probably looking for some type of control. Like what are these are gonna be controls and one of them will not be. So we see the word accept, we wanna make sure that we're choosing the one that is not true. Okay, so let's look at this. Equal concentrations of RNAase were used in the RNAase plus lanes? Yeah, I hope so. If they weren't, that would be pretty rough to actually figure out if it was making a difference. So hopefully that, those were all equal. What they're putting in should be equal. Equal concentrations of nuclear extract, right? That would be the ERB2. Um, I would hope so. Yeah, I would hope that they put the same amount into each. If they're not doing that, um, that would make a pretty bad experience. So yeah, the A and B, right, those are both gonna be pretty standard controls. Or we gotta put the same amount of RNA ACE and we gotta put the same amount of ERB, right, in nuclear extract. 
um, like what we're putting in needs to be the same every time for sure. Unless we're noting on that x-axis that we're doing different concentrations, which they didn't note that. So they are not studying something along those lines. All right, equal amounts of ERB in complex with other protein forms in all of the lanes after RNAase treatment. Okay, we probably wouldn't assume this, right? Because if we go back over to our figure, what did they put in here? They put in all of the putative binding partners, or we, or maybe not all, but they put in at least a few, right? Because partners is in the plural here, right? So kind of like we mentioned when we were looking at this figure, some of them are going to bind and some of them are going to not bind. Like some of them may be competing for the same site. We don't actually know. That could be why these three um, kind of with RNAs are not identical. Right? They're a little different. So C seems like we would probably not assume this, that we would have equal amounts in complex because some of them are going to bind in different ways depending on um, what happens. That's probably why we see different results. Also interesting to note that C has nothing to do with what the researchers actually put in to the experiment, which that both A and B, right, were used or were loaded, right, we should expect standardization for that, but this is about what ERB is actually doing, right, complex with all other, with other protein forms in all of the lanes, right, that's what happens afterwards, we can maybe expect that to be different, that's why we're doing the study. And then D, the antibody for ERB is specific to the protein at a site distinct from protein interaction sites. Y yes, right, this is, this is something that they must assume because if this is not happening, right, if the antibody that we're using to kind of just see where ERB is, if that um, is not at a site that's distinct from all these other protein interaction sites. It might not bind and then we just wouldn't see it and then when the proteins interact with ERB we wouldn't see a line. It would just disappear um, and that's bad, right? That We need to be able to at least see things. So I hope that the antibody for ERB is specific to the protein at its kind of its own site that no one else binds to. So that, that should be assumed. So we're going to go with C here because C is the only one that is talking about um, what would happen afterwards. And it's also consistent with our results, right? We do see a different kind of amounts of binding here when we have RNAase. Okay, that one was a lot more work, um, but we got there. Um, when you are actually working on questions like these on test day, you wanna go a lot quicker. You don't need to be as thorough, um, but and again, this is a, just a full walkthrough. Um, we're not gonna have enough time to have this full kind of walkthrough during your own test day. But um, there's an example of what the full logic would be. You wanna cut down on that as you practice and you get more efficient with working through figures and passages. Okay, number four here. Why do researchers include the input lanes in both RNAase conditions in figure two, right? Again, just like we talked about with number three, we wanna be looking specific to figure two here. Okay, so why do we have those input lanes? Right, again, let's look at figure two. Those input lanes are when we're doing just AGO2 and nothing else, right? Bound would be ERB2. TEV L1 is um, AGO2 and that specific IgG. And then the second IgG as well, right? So that's what those are. So again, we're just gonna, um, we're looking at just that input lane. Why do we do that? probably as some form of control, right? Kind of like we were talking about before, some kind of making sure that we do actually have the thing that we're looking for. A pot, we would call that a positive control. Okay, so why do they include that input lane? To determine the concentration before the experiment? Uh, they probably already know that. They don't need to determine it. They're, admitted, they're putting in some kind of concentration. I hope they're not determining it based on the input lane. B, to ensure the equal amounts of AGO2 were present before experimental treatment? Yes, right? That is important because remember, what's our difference between these two graphs? It's RNAase, right? So if we put input AGO2 with RNAase and then we input AGO2 with RNAase, we want to make sure that we're getting the same amount, which we did here, and that RNAase isn't acting on AGO2 by itself, right? We want RNAase to be acting on AGO2 with ERB, and then whatever these IgG things are as well, right? So that's important, right? We, we could almost just answer B and move on here because that, that's why we're doing it. 
um, C to measure the amount of ERB2 complex without RNAase, right? That's not the purpose of the input lane. That's that's a different portion, right? We're comparing that. Um, we're comparing the bound versus the bound, right? That's what that is. And then D to increase the likelihood of binding events for later conditions. Um, I, I'm not even sure how to make sense of this statement, right? It's so illogical for what's going on here, where we're talking about the input lane. Um, doing the input lane does not increase the likelihood for binding events for later conditions like adding ERB2. Um, it just makes it possible. So yeah, not a great, not a great answer there. So yeah, B is going to be our best answer there. And then let's look at number five, our last question here. Which of the following conclusions is best supported by figure two? Again, we're looking specifically at figure two. Um, we're looking for best supported. These are one of those that are really difficult for us to answer just straight up um, without looking at the answer choices. But briefly, right, remember, let's look at what's different. Input's the same, bound is different. And then these IgGs, I'm not sure, let's just ignore them for now. If they're somehow involved, we'll do it. But right, we're looking at there's a difference between Neg without and with, or in the negative and the positive, RNAase for the bound only, right? Because that's what kind of the whole passage was about, the ERB2 complex that's bound with the AgO2. So that is different, which is what we wanted. Okay, so A, an RNA molecule plays a role in the AgO2 ERB2 interaction. That was the whole purpose of the whole study, and it seems like it does play a role. Okay, so we could probably just answer that, but let's double check to make sure none of these are correct. ERB2 is not expressed when RNAase is present, um, right? That's actually just false, right? Because if we look back over, when RNAase is present, that's here, right? We do, you can, can you kind of see it there? It's pretty, it's there. Um, also, this is not even looking at ERB2, this is looking at bound, right? So we're looking at ERB2 with AGO2, right, AGO2 and ERB2. So we're not even looking at that. So this would be almost more of a figure one idea. So not a great answer. C, AGO2 binds ERB2 more tightly in the absence of RNA. Um, let's look, so absence, right, so when we don't have RNA, does AGO2 bind ERB2 more tightly? Um, I don't, we don't really know how tight it's bound. We're looking at just bound or unbound, not at tightness, right? We didn't really, didn't really look at that. We just looked at a Western blot. Does it exist or not? So the tightly thing we couldn't evaluate. So that C is not a good answer. And then D, AGO2 is upregulated when RNAase is present, right? So we're looking at just AGO2 and then RNAase present or absent, right? That would be just that input line there. And look, RNAase, Absent, RNA is present, same. Like they look nearly identical in terms of Western blot there. So no, not upregulated, it'd be the exact same. So D is not true, we're gonna go with A there. Okay, so I hope that that was helpful for you guys. Um, yeah, so if you could go ahead and go into the description below, you could click the link there and we'll send you a daily MCAT question to your email inbox, which can help with your daily studying. Um, so yeah, good luck, you guys, and I'll see you guys in the next one.